Uh, greetings. My name is Nikki Benoit, and I will be your animal and environmental ethics educator. The name of my presentation today is Non-Human Animal Ethics, and I say it that way uh, to illustrate the greater issue, the bigger picture among folks within our culture and our industries, such that we have disconnected ourselves from other animal species. So I want to remind everybody that we are, in fact, animals. So, and it is a little odd to say non-human animal ethics. So intermittently throughout today's presentation, I will interchange it from animal to non-human animal, depending on the point I hope to make. But really, this elongated title is just a way to reconnect you with the fact that we as humans are, in fact, animals as other species. Now, I do have um, uh, Gandhi is a very prominent leader in our world. We are all very well aware of his influence and spiritual leadership. And this quote is very powerful in this issue in that the greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way its animals are treated. Now, I don't view this as uh, Gandhi viewing non-human animals more important than human animals. I don't see that he had more of a, a compassion for them. It was, it's an issue where the most vulnerable among you, I believe, is an indicator. If you extend compassion to the most vulnerable, the least likely to retaliate or to call you out or um, alert the uh, authorities of your abuse to them, if you extend compassion to them, it really says something about your character. And further, it says a lot about the culture and the community with which you live and the lifestyles of those around you. So keep that in mind throughout this quick presentation. Um, as that's what he meant. We've seen many variations of this and many different commercials or different things that, you know, the greatness of your community is based on how you treat your elderly or your children. This is true, but I think beyond that, extending further beyond to non-human animals is the point he wanted to make. Now, the next slide, we have a test. And this is a really quick minute and a half test, so get your Get your counting mind ready, and it's, it's a situational awareness illustration. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the test right now so we can further this point. This is an awareness test. How many passes? So this, I think, was a great illustration of the bigger picture with which among our culture and our societies, so much is going on behind the scenes that unless you're focused on it, unless you're specifically looking for it, it could be a part of your daily activity and you would never know. And this does not only apply to the way we treat non-human animals, this applies to how we treat other genders, other ethnic groups, other sexual orientation, our environment. It, has a wide range of ramifications when you're not looking at the big picture. So again, just keep that in mind. Now, the next slide, I indicate animal rights is not a point that I hope to make. It's not a, a label I appreciate. I don't find that the title animal rights really captures the essence of the issues. Now, it's not that we want to elevate animals, other animal species, to the same level as humans, right? Uh, we don't, non-human animals don't need to have the right to a jury trial. They don't need to have the right to bear arms. They don't need the privileges of driving automobiles and other motor vehicles. That's not really the issue that we're focused on here. What we're wanting to do in the movement and the animal advocacy realm is to point out the inherent value, the bodily integrity, all other species should have by birthright. It's extending compassion and the rights for others to live their lives for their own reasons and to be amused for their own end. My cats, for instance, 
don't like to ride in kayaks, they don't like to go dancing at the clubs, and they most certainly don't like popsicles and motorcycles. They like catnip, they like strings. Those are things that my cats enjoy. So we don't have a lot in common, but they have the right to live their lives free from pain and suffering and to be a means to their own end. So I haven't coined a term for what really would encapsulate extending compassion to all other species, but you get my drift. Now, circles of compassion, we each have our own, right? We have our friends, our family, our loved ones, our neighbors, our in-laws, whichever. Our, our circle of compassion, we each have our own. And there's always the infamous hand-selected companion animals that are dogs and cats, our infamous best friends, dogs and cats. I have cats as well. And in the circle of compassion, we even incorporate birds and hamsters and hermit crabs and other companion animals, domesticated animals, and even further into that, we appreciate the aesthetic value of wild animals such as squirrels and wolves and polar bears and the eagles. We've incorporated these individuals into the realm of whom we're concerned for and will work to protect. But for some reason, within our culture, again, we have arbitrarily left certain animals out. They're not worthy of our compassion. We will bring dogs and cats into our homes and give them health insurance and toys and ample supplies of food and treats and warmth and little, little sweaters. But yet we've decided that strategically on the outside of that circle is where cows and ducks and pigs and chickens and turkeys belong. Now, even then, yes, dogs and cats are worthy of compassion. And even some primates and other wild animals are worthy of the human compassion However, within our culture, within the very fiber of our culture, are many industries that use, abuse, exploit, and torture innocent beings for seemingly needful and useful human benefits. I'm going to introduce you to a brief glimpse of every industry, and with each slide I've provided a link to a website so that you can learn more. I'm not going to spend every a lot of time on all the issues, but rather one main industry. But as you're going to be introduced to, there are links to other issues, and some of them are very disturbing. But I do ask that you are aware, because with awareness breeds alternative solutions, compassionate solutions, and you have the capacity to make those compassionate alternative choices. So the first industry is animals and research. Many people don't realize that in today's day there are still an overabundance of animals and, in fact, an uncounted number of animals in cages throughout the world being used for animal research for mostly human benefit. But even beyond human benefit, there are issues that we are already well aware of. For instance, cigarette smoking. These beagles are very po popular among research animals because they're small and they're easy to handle and they're very docile. Well, they've been pumping animals full of cigarette smoke since as far back as I can remember to see if it causes cancer. We know it causes cancer. I Am Dog Food is one of the most common companies who uses animals in their research techniques, cramming them in cages and not attending to them with veterinary care. Primates are still very heavily tested upon and even being injected with the HIV virus to see if they'll develop AIDS. And over 35 years, I believe one primate has developed AIDS. The reason they do this is these animals are easy to use. There's no regulations in place to protect them or to ensure that they are safe and well taken care of. Again, you can learn more about this at vivisectioninfo.org. And most of what scientists face in their career is publish or perish. So there lies the motivation behind using animals and research for cosmetic purposes and household cleaners and so forth. 